Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, to begin, before we pray, uh, I'm going to read, uh, and while you're still turning, I'm going to read a quote by C.S. Lewis uh, in his book called The Problem of Pain. And he begins chapter 2 with this quote. It's an anonymous quote. He says, If God were good, he would wish to make his creatures happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, Mr. Lewis believe this. It's obvious as you go through and read the chapter. But he uses this quote to show how the logic of man arrives at its conclusions. Um, we need to know that the reason for happiness and disappointment and all of those things that exist in the world isn't because of God's ability or inability, but because of sin and death in the world. Uh, and the very fact is, is that God does have the power to make a change, and He did when He sent His Son so that He can bring joy to us in Jesus Christ. Uh, but even for the Christian, a a constant unhappiness, or or in order to have joy, it really stems from what the, the truths that Paul has been laying forth here in the book of Ephesians. Um, and just who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and in chapter 1, to do a, 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 a review, the fact that uh, here we have this, this doctrine, this truth that is laid forth here about what God is doing today in the age of grace. The fact that we are in Christ when we, when we trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. And being in Christ brings with it all spiritual blessing. Uh, we read Paul's prayer here for the saints uh, that, that they, we would be able to comprehend this truth. Uh, which means really to... to understand the full reality of it, that this isn't just a fairy tale. This isn't just a religious book. This is a record of what you are in Jesus Christ. Um, and then, finally, as we, he goes on and as he's talking about who we were and what God has done for us to bring us out, uh, from being dead in trespasses and sins to alive in Christ and, and breaking down the middle wall of partition so that we can be part of the family and the household of God, Paul is now going to begin to tradition or begin to transition to the fact that yes, here are these wonderful truths. But the truth of the matter is that these, these truths of who you are should reflect in what you do and how you live. And so that's where the epistle is, is heading. All of this is true of you. And so all of this, as far as living is concerned, should be equally true. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, God and Father, as we come before you today, uh, Father, I just in a little... Uh, silly things today, uh, maybe mishearing someone or forgetting something or, or all of those things. And, and we're human. It all happens. But to stop and remember that that never happens to you. That you are God who knows all, who knows perfectly, uh, the end from the beginning. And to think, Father, of who we are in Jesus Christ and now what we are called to. And Father, we don't do this in our strength, but we do it from the resources and the identity of who we are in your Son. So Father, as we begin this chapter, I just pray that it's your word that speaks. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm just going to read verse 1. Uh, man, I'll read verse 3, I can, or 3 verses because I can't. Uh, Ephesians 4 verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we ultimately have a call here. 
we ultimately have a, a how this happened or, or how it should look and really the, the goal. But as I go back, as I call your attention to verse 1, I'm going to call your attention to that, that word, therefore. Therefore is a, is a bridge. It takes you from all that has been said, and now, as I already, uh, as I already mentioned, it takes you from what has been said to now what's going to be said. Uh, because all this is true. When we understand the doctrine, uh, which is the factual truths, that have already been laid out here. When we comprehend that truth, the reality of it, it will affect our walk. And despite all the claims today that truth is fluid and, and your truth is your truth and my truth is our, my truth and let's just, they're equally valid. Uh, well, I'll say, uh, point of, I will say bluntly, that's not true. That's right. Doctrine, for some reason, it has gotten a, a, a bad rap. But doctrine is just a, a simple word that means the teaching, the truth. Uh, and it is important. It is important to know what God is doing today so we can know how to live in order to properly uh, please Him. It's, it's important to know who we are in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ so we have the proper motivation to, to live as we are told to live here in these next few chapters of the book of Ephesians and, and elsewhere in the Scriptures. And uh, whatever doctrines have been committed to us, to God's people, are always done with the intention of affecting conduct. And if it doesn't affect your conduct, you kind of put a, 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 an off switch there that God never intended to be. Uh, he tended to be a flow from one to the other, from the understanding and the changing of the heart to then the behavior. Uh, Paul Sadler, uh, he gave us an excellent example of that from the Old Testament. Uh, he pointed to Exodus 31, 14, and, and this is what that verse says. It says, Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it, defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein that soul shall be cut off from among his people. In other words, uh, there was a truth that was given to the nation of Israel. It was in regards to the Sabbath. The Sabbath, they could do uh, no work therein. It was to be sanctified and holy and hallowed. And it affected their life. They had to prepare because on the Sabbath, uh, there were certain things they were unable to do. Uh, and so it affected their life and the fact that they had to prepare meals beforehand, that they had to gather work, or they had to gather wood beforehand, that they had to buy and sell the other days of the week because they weren't allowed to do it on the Sabbath. They had to, their travel was restricted. All of those things, it affected their very lives. It wasn't just a truth written on a, 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 a tablet somewhere. It was a truth that was that was commanded to them, and it affected their lives. I think back to manna, and I'll use the manna as an example. Uh, if you don't know what manna is, God provided the manna as food for the Israelites. And even his provision of manna was affected by the truth of the Sabbath. Uh, because on the day before the Sabbath, which was Friday, uh, they were to gather uh, a double portion because there was going to be no manna on the next day. Uh, so it affected their very lives. And we are not under law, we're under grace, but these truths that we have been going through and will go through, they should affect our attitudes, our motivations, uh, everything uh, about our not just living, but life itself. Uh, by the way, in comparison, uh, I read you there uh, Exodus 31, 14 that talks about the Sabbath. Uh, in Colossians 2, 16 through 17, Paul tells us, let us, let no man therefore judge you in drink or in respect of a holy day or in the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so when we understand that truth, uh, we understand that, hey, I can make a pot roast on Sunday. Uh, I can cut down that tree that fell on my roof or whatever on, on, on Sunday. Um, 
because of, of God's grace. Now, uh, um, Warren Wearsby wrote this, when people say, don't talk to me about doctrine, just let me live my Christian life, they are revealing their ignorance of the way the Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer, which is through the word of God applied to the heart. By trying to live a Christian life without God's truth, we have cut ourselves off from the source and the strength and the motivation and all of that to live such a life. And I, I don't need to tell you, I don't want to bum you out, but we live, again, we live in a world where we decide for ourselves what is good for us. And I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it, but there have been times I can look back on my life and I thought, well, maybe God, you know, maybe he didn't know quite, I don't, that wasn't my thought process. I didn't say, God doesn't know what he's talking about. But, you know, you just, that whole flesh thing, what it does, the reasons, and I can tell you, every time I thought that maybe what God says here, maybe I, maybe, you know, I can, we, we are allowed to go out of the boundaries a little bit. Uh, it has been proven to me that God's ways are always the best ways. So, uh, when, when we talk about truth and how it affects life, uh, we, we think about the, the truth of, of the mystery committed to Paul. Uh, the fact that, as Ephesians has told us, because we've been blessed with all spiritual blessing, because God has graciously saved us despite how undeserving that we were, because God has joined us as a, as a new creation, because God is the one empowering you, the next few chapters say, so walk. I'm not living so that... I, I will get, uh, so that God will allow me to be forgiven, or so that God will allow me to be redeemed, or I already am. And I walk out of appreciation of that. That fact, that truth. Uh, it's, I was going to say again about the, the world and its system, and I don't know what bummed me out, but uh, just let me say one more thing about that. Um, the thinking that we can pick and choose what we like and don't like, uh, including from the book of, of Ephesians. Uh, you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, you know, the verse 21, submitting yourselves, one of uh, chapter 5, submitting yourselves to one another. Well, I'm not going to submit to them unless they do all this and all those things. Wait a minute. What does God say? Not what do you think, or what do you not like, or what do you want to throw away, or what do you want to ignore, but thus saith the word. Okay. And that thinking that we get to decide really goes back, it's nothing new. Uh, we tend to think, oh, society is going so far away from the word of God. It started back in Genesis, That's right. where God said, don't eat. And the serpent came along, and he didn't say, hey, God the fool, eat what you want to kind of reason them through it. And what got them was, yes, the fruit, fruit looked really good, uh, and we can be like gods. <coughs> and by saying, you know what, God didn't know what he was saying when he wrote that, or saying, I don't like that, or whatever you're saying, you're saying, I know better than God. I guarantee you, every time, God knows better than you. Um, I think of uh, that, that whole attitude just reminds me of what it says in Proverbs. Proverbs 12, 15. Listen, it says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And uh, that, that verse means a whole lot more when you understand the context of the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's not just any counsel, it's wise counsel. And wise counsel comes from one who fears and respects and reveres the things of the Lord. And so in saying, I can do my own thing, I can decide for myself, I know better God, for, than God in this area, 
Well, Proverbs says that's foolish. Uh, but seeking counsel, godly counsel, from his word and from godly people, uh, that is the wise thing. Um, and quite honestly, it's true that I cannot tell you what to believe. You can't tell anyone what to believe. That's their choice. I'm not the authority uh, on right and wrong. However, this, you can't see what it is, it's the Bible. This is the authority. God does have the authority and the position to say, this is right, this is wrong. This is what I require, this is what I don't. And the fact of the matter is, is this word rightly divided is how everyone's going to be judged according to this authority. Someday they're not going to stand up there and say, hey, Pastor Matt, uh, Pastor Matt Ritchie, yeah, he lived um, 1978 to, to 2021. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you can work that out in your own mind. But, uh, but yeah, he said this, and you didn't do that, so uh, that's a check mark against you. It's not going to be me. It's not going to be any other pastor out there or any other religious leader or any other religious book. It's going to be God and his standards. And people are going to be judged according to what saith the scripture. What did God say? Uh, his word serves as the authority of right and, right and wrong. And each and every one of us, whether you're Pastor Matt or whether you're, you're uh, someone else, we better make sure we're proclaiming that authority and not our own. Right. Um, the key word in these last few cha uh, last few chapters of Ephesians is the word walk. Walk. Notice in verse 1 it says, walk worthy. And so with this verse we start to go beyond just what is true and knowing what is true. We go on comprehending what is real and factual. And we are now called to empower God to help us live out this truth in our lives. And we're, we're, we are urged to focus uh, that power on work and what we do in, in walking. It deals with how we live our life. It deals with our conduct in life. It deals with behavior. It deals with our manner in life, our goals in life, our philosophy of life, all of those things. Uh, and it comes down to how do you live and what are you known for? I'm going to throw out some names for you, to you, all right? Just to keep you awake. And you tell me, you know, something that they're known for, all right? Here we go. Uh, and just general. I mean, you can be, whatever. I'm not going to assign too many rules to it. But uh, what about someone like Michelangelo? What are they known for? Painting. Art. Painting. Art. All right? Uh, if my kids are here, they would say Ninja Turtles, but uh, that's the wrong answer. Um, what about George Washington? President. President. First president. Yes. Great military leader. Something like that. What about, uh, oh, I'm not in. I'm not in uh, uh, I was going to say Detroit Lions, but I'm, I'm afraid of the answer. Um, uh, how about D.L. Moody? Let's stay religious. Evangelist. Evangelist, the preacher, uh, something like that. Uh, what about Bill Gates? Computer. Yeah, computer, a businessman, rich, Microsoft, something like that. Uh, as Christians, one thing should, there is one thing, and actually, to be more realistic, one person we should be known for, and that's Christ. We may be a Christian, but people should know us for something else, Christ. Right. He is the one we want people to come to. Not our own ideology and, and all of those things. Uh, but notice here in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 4, it doesn't just say walk. It says walk worthy. And that word worthy means you walk in keeping with. Or you walk in accordance to. Or you walk in a manner that becomes. So all that has come before... Uh, all that we are in Christ, all that He has given to us, all He has done for us, all of those things, our walk, our behavior, our conduct, our living should be in, in accordance to that truth. It says, uh, walk worthy of the vocation. And uh, the word vocation is uh, basically a, a duty. It's a calling. 
Um, it is a, uh, uh, your responsibility as a believer. Uh, or your responsibility as, a, as one who is in the body of Christ. Uh, and when we know elsewhere in the scriptures, it talks about uh, we are ambassadors of Christ. And I like to tie that reality in with the, the, uh, the, the command here to, or the instruction here to walk worthy. When we understand ourselves as an ambassador, uh, it is, the ambassador is, and you know what an ambassador is, but I'm going to remind you, it is the, a representative of one country in another country. Uh, and uh, they they are there in that they are there on behalf of their their native country. They go into a foreign capital and they represent their native country to that that other country. Um, and so for 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 the U U.S. ambassador to uh, Ireland or the U.S. ambassador to uh, whatever uh, Israel or whatever it is, uh, they are not a member of that host country, they are a member of the sending country. And here's the thing, the ambassador is not there, hey, I want to be an ambassador so I can visit all these places in this country. That may be one of the perks of the job. Uh, but he's there to represent not himself, and uh, I mean, I guess you can make a case for the, the, the president who sent him or whatever, but ultimately he's there to represent the interest of the United States of America. And I love that, that, that fact that we are ambassadors because we are, we are kind of like nomadic here. We don't, our home is not here. Amen. Yes, I understand. You can take out your phone and say, well, yeah, but here's my house. See, well, okay, fine. Uh, you may have that temporary structure that you live in and sleep in and all of those things. But our eternal home is in heaven. Amen. And so with that being the truth, with, with our citizenship having translated there, we are here representing something greater than our own interests. <clears throat> and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm thankful that when we don't represent him well, we're not kicked out. I'll get somebody else to represent me. But what a blessing and opportunity it is to be able to walk worthy and represent him well. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that we have been bought with a price. We are not our own. And I understand the world... Uh, as soon as you say something like that, they, they, they pull back from it. They cringe. But when we stop and think of the reality that there is a price that needs to be paid. And if that price wasn't paid, the hopeless eternity that awaited us. We were so far in debt that we were never going to, to pay enough to get out of that debt. And we had a Savior come along and say, I will pay it all. Our experiences with employers and all of those things cannot taint our, our understanding of the blessing of belonging to God. Of being part of who He is and what He is doing. What a blessing to know that we're not our own. We are His. Now we live life here with a higher purpose than just do as much as you can, enjoy life until you die. But we can live for eternity uh, for him, and we can do it effectively in him. Let me let me throw out another verse to you in Galatians 2:20. It says, "I am crucified with Christ; nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith 
of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I hope this means something to you when you come to a point in your life and you say, I can't go on. And you remember, wait a minute. I don't have the strength to go on, but I know someone who does. And I am in him, and his life can be lived out in me. The fact that what that comes down to, and we're going to find this out as we go through the book of Ephesians, but what it comes down to is yielding. Is, you know, you, you hear all kinds of cliches, Jesus take the wheel, give him the reins, all of those things. And ultimately what they're describing is yield. You are in control. You have to do this. You've called me to walk worthy. We have to uh, we have to allow him to work in us and through us. And Colossians 2 6 says, As you have received Christ Jesus, therefore walk ye in him. You did not receive Jesus Christ because you were such a great guy or gal. Uh, you did not receive Christ by the works of the flesh, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so if we received him because of his faithfulness and the work of the Holy Spirit, that's how we are to walk, to represent, to, to fulfill our calling and our vocation and how we can walk worthy. Uh, getting back to that word vocation in Ephesians 4.1, I already said it's a duty. It is our calling, it is our responsibility as a Christian to walk worthy. We are told that all those truths that have been uh, set, up, set out for us so far in the book of Ephesians that uh, we are expected to reflect those truths of being in Christ in the way we live. It is to be our life. It is the fact that uh, it, life is not about us anymore. It is now about Him. And part of the, the uh, I can't think of the word, the, the rebelling against that thought is an improper understanding of what we are in Jesus Christ. How full and free and complete and blessed we are in Him. We have this duty, this responsibility. Now we have a choice to walk worthy. There are some who would say, well, we, we, there's, no, there's no choice here. We can or we can't. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have beseeched them to walk worthy. Um, uh, but if we, if we choose, sadly, not to walk worthy, it doesn't affect the truth of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. However, after all God has done for us, and why it's so important to understand the first three chapters is, when we understand them completely and comprehend them more and more, we come to verse four, chapter 4, verse 1, and we say, of course. Why would I not want to? I understand who I was without Him and what He has done to take me from being destitute and dead and trespassed in sins, an alien, a foreigner, without Christ, without God, and I understand He has now remedied all of that, and I stand in Him complete, alive, righteous, forgiven, saved, redeemed, all of those things. Of course, I want to walk worthy of the one, who, that great God who did that for me. It says we are called, the vocation, the duty wherewith we are called. This responsibility has already been set upon us. Many people are looking for the writing on the wall, so to speak. I want to serve the Lord. I just need, I just need a sign. You know, I need to be in my bedroom have a, 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 a Samuel moment. Or, you know, I need to uh, pick up my Bible and read. Matt Ritchie. It's me. Right here in Hezekiah chapter 16, verse 9. Matt Ritchie. Go, thou shalt go to Michigan. And that's what people are looking for, unfortunately. So they just don't do anything. 
And what we have here is the fact that we have already been called to something. That's right. To walk worthy. The specifics, they'll take care of themselves. Uh, believe me, they will. Um, the other thing that I want you to understand is that too many times we think pastors or missionaries or evangelists or minister, ministry leaders, they have a calling. And they do. But right here in Ephesians 4.1, what it reminds you of is we all do. Not just your pastors, not just the missionaries, not just the evangelists, not just the minister, ministry leaders that are called to walk worthy. That are called to live godly in Christ Jesus. It's every single one of us who are a believer in Jesus Christ. I ask you, can we, can we, uh, do we have a choice? Do we have a, do we have a choice whether we walk worthy or not? Yeah. Do we have a choice of whether we're called or not? No. We already are. And why I point that out is because we have been called to a duty to walk worthy. We can choose whether to fulfill that call that to fulfill that calling or not, but the responsibility is still upon us. I think of Paul, and I'm going to paraphrase this very loosely. Uh, but he says, um, yeah, I'm not even going to remember how to paraphrase it, but he says. A dispensation has been committed unto me, and, and basically says, "Can I? Can I? I have a choice whether to fulfill that dispensation, that, that calling, or, or not. But it's still committed to me, and it's the same." I told you I was going to le easily paraphrase it, but but here it's the same thing. We have been called with a vocation. We have a duty. We have uh, a responsibility. And man, what a blessing it is to be able to walk forward. And we're going to develop this, obviously, as we continue on through the book of Ephesians. Uh, but uh, at the Bema seat, when we stand before the Lord one day, this is one of the responsibilities, I believe, that, uh, that's going to be, to be discerned. Uh, did we choose to walk worthy? I don't think it is our perfection. Um, I think it's where we yield it. And I look at that list of names in Hebrews 11. We're not going to look at it, but uh, you can look at it later. All of those people there. And I read through that list and I say, you know what? I know something about him. There were times he didn't. He, he didn't. He wasn't faithful. I know something about him. I know an incident where, where he got in trouble. When he got chastised by the Lord. And yet they're there in the hall of faith. Or what we call the hall of faith. And that should encourage you that um, when we find ourselves walking less than worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called, to not say, oh, uh, I'm, I'm lost, I can't, but to, to acknowledge it, to get back up and say, Lord, thank you for your grace. Help me from here on out. When we fall down, I think the bigger question is, when we fall down, when we trip at that stumbling block, do we get back up? When we make a mistake, or uh, to put a blunder, when we sin, do we admit it? Do we acknowledge it? And look for the one who can help. One does not become spiritual by doing certain things. He is spiritual because of his or her relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and relationships are, on our end, are continual work. Uh, and as we grow, I hope, as you, uh, if, if you're married, the more years that pass, um, you understand some things that may irk your partner, and so you work not to do those things, or maybe you do just to get a reaction out of them, and that's that's between you and them. But um, but you, you begin to, to learn how uh, two lives as one can be more and more in harmony. I'm thinking of all kinds of examples of my personal life, but we're not going to go there. But as we continue, next week as we continue here in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, walk worthy because we have been called to this. We have been made responsible 
for this great blessing. And we need to stop seeing service as a burden and start seeing it as a blessing and a privilege. And he goes on in, in just chapter 4, and, and one of the ways we can walk worthy is in chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, we walk worthy by walking in unity. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 17 through 517, we walk worthy in purity. In chapter 5, 18 through 6, 9, we walk worthy in harmony. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 24, we walk worthy in victory. And after this introductory verse that we spent some time on today, uh, what we're going to get into, this first section deals with unity of believers. And uh, I'll give you a little uh, sneak peek. If you read verse 2, you'll see it. you aren't united by always getting your way. Uh, because it's all about Him and His way. Uh, let's pray. God and Father, thank you for this reminder today of uh, that who we are in Christ has a purpose. And a purpose is that we here on earth can be your representatives. That we can now live in accordance to who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, it's something that you entrust to us. And yes, we can choose yay or nay, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it has been entrusted to us. And Father, when we understand more and more who we are in you, how could we not say, Lord, thank you for the privilege I have to walk in accordance to what you have made me, the price you've paid to make me righteous in your sight. So Father, help us just to contemplate and reflect on these things as we go through our week. And may you, may our lives bring you, may our lives uh, glorify you uh, amongst other believers and amongst those we come in contact with in the world. So thank you, Father, for the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I pray today. Amen. And it actually springs from our message from Sunday, uh, and on Sunday, if uh, that was quite a few days away, so uh, just to remind you, we uh, we picked up our um, study through the book of Ephesians again, and uh, we I dealt with verse one of Ephesians four. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, and. Every Sunday, there's probably more that I don't have time to say uh, than what I actually do take time to say. Uh, and there's so many different ways that you can present uh, the passages that you are in. A lot of it has to do with, with focus and uh, all of those things. And so uh, this evening gives me an opportunity to kind of Seg to focus on a, a different aspect of uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And just even as I was reading that verse before I clicked the go live button for this evening, I noticed how Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the, the Lord. And I was trying to glance through a quick and see how many times Paul assigns a uh, a title to himself in Ephesians chapter, uh, in, or in the book of Ephesians. And uh, that seems to be the third uh, time that he uh, he said, well, there in, in Ephesians 4.1, uh, he says, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord. Well, he started chapter 3 uh, by calling himself Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he started the entire book, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, by calling himself, by titling himself Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so that was something that just kind of uh, caught my eye uh, today or this evening. Um, and something I'll probably take a little bit of t more time uh, looking into. But anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into our study. And uh, if you were not here... Uh, I will tell you, we're going to take a, we're not going to push through Mark. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to actually, um, this is actually kind of tied into our, our message from Sunday. 
whereas the first three chapters as we were going through the book of Ephesians really had really focused on our inability to do anything uh, the 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 God has done everything he has given us everything in Jesus Christ uh, that he is the one that changed even the relationship uh, so that we can be saved uh, and uh, and now we come to the part of Ephesians where uh, basically Paul is going to go on and he's going to say, do, 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 do. And sometimes as, as grace believers, we are so zealous and rightfully so to make sure people know that we are saved not of works, uh, that none of our works can save us, uh, that we forget, yes, but we are then saved to work. And we had a little glimpse uh, of that uh, earlier in the book of Ephesians where um, Paul uh, wrote, uh, we are his workmanship uh, in Ephesians 2.10, um, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so we are not saved by our works. However, we are saved to now live in a different way and to, to work for the Lord. And so that's what I want to focus on and for the next, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, uh, or 25 minutes, depending on, I don't know, uh, how long I go here. But, um, but I want to, but because I don't, I didn't have time Sunday to go through some of these things, I want to go through them this evening. And uh, some of them are probably familiar uh, passages, and that's okay. But uh, I was going to have you turn to Philippians, but let's do, yeah, turn to Philippians. It's only a book away, so just turn forward to the book of Ephesians, or yeah, Philippians, uh, and then chapter 2, if you will. Philippians chapter 2. And uh, I am going to read 12 through 16. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And so each of these passages I'm going to turn to are, are a sermon or two in and of themselves. But as we come to the part in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul really starts to focus on work, and service, and life, and ministry, and, I mean, whatever, behavior, whatever word you want to kind of include there, um, I want to make the point that the first three chapters of Ephesians are so important, uh, because understanding who we are in Christ, that we did nothing to be saved, that uh, uh, all that God did so that we can be saved and belong to him. Uh, that is so important, our identity uh, and our possessions in Christ, to then, it's important to know all of that in order to to serve, to live, to work uh, correctly and appropriately. And it is not a bad word, and it is not bad practice, to tell grace believers, God expects us to work. Uh, and uh, even there in Philippians, uh, he, he says, work out your own salvation. In other words, we are saved. Part of our salvation is, yes, deliverance from hell. That's usually what we focus on. Sometimes it's forgiveness of sins. We focus on that. And amen, praise the Lord. But part of our salvation is that God has fitted us and furnished us to work. And so when Paul says, work out your own salvation, it is a possession that we have. And part of that salvation is to take 
all we are now, to take our identity in Christ and allow that to, to change us, to change our behavior, uh, to, to put to death the flesh, and, uh, and to serve, uh, to, to, to act out and to behave appropriately according to who we are now in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's so easy uh, to do that when uh, we're in the presence of someone that, uh, well, uh, that that expects us to to live godly in Christ Jesus, but uh, thankfully the Philippians, Paul says, now that I'm not there, yeah, even more so, uh, with with fear, with reverence and respect of who God is, uh, and uh, but verse 15 is you know 14 and 15. I almost wish they wouldn't have separated them when they were separating verses into chapters and, uh, and verse and while well, they were separating the, the scriptures into chapters and verses, uh, because then sometimes people focus on verse 14 or 15 and it's a harmony that's there. We are to work out, but it's God that works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. So even as we come to the part in Ephesians where now we're going to focus on do, 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 behave, behave, walk, walk, live, live, all of those things, uh, God hasn't cut the string and, and, uh, let us float away by ourselves. He's there still working in us. Uh, and so, man, that just blows my mind that we have been given a responsibility, uh, to, to work and to do. And yet God is still there willing to do the work, uh, in us and through us. Uh, also in, here in, in this passage in Philippians, of course, without murmuring, just in disputing. Uh, how many of us have a job or, or a chore uh, or something or a responsibility, and we do it, but begrudgingly. All right, fine, I'll do it just because I have to do it. Da, da, da. And we don't enjoy it necessarily. But the work we do for the Lord and the work he does in us and through us, man, what a joy. Uh, when we when we understand it appropriately, what a privilege and opportunity and blessing that it is, and we do live in a crooked and perverse nation. And you know, there's there's a, at least two nations represented here this evening. Uh, I don't care if you're on this side of the pond or the other side of the pond. Uh, we live in a in a in a fallen, perverse world, and our responsibility our work to do is to to shine uh to uh to um to be blameless and harmless and without rebuke as the sons of god uh, we are his sons uh fully grown sons fully in inherited sons and uh we are to and and by be saying without rebuke uh, harmless uh blameless all of those things basically what that saying is is live the way God set you free to live. Don't 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 take part in their crookedness and their perverseness, uh, but but make sure that our lives consistently and and persistently and continually uh, reflect uh, who we are in 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 uh, in Christ. In verse sixteen, holding forth the word of life, that is our main responsibility if I can say it that way, is that, that gospel of the grace of God, that holding it forth and, and offering it and proclaiming it and, and, uh, and telling it and sharing it. Um, uh, and what a joy that that is. And so as we, again, uh, as we come to, we segue from those first three chapters of Ephesians into the last three chapters, uh, how that harmonizes. Um, uh, the, the fact that we are saved and in that salvation that we possess, it is to be acted out. It's to be worked out. Uh, and, uh, and there should be a behavior, ch there should be a priority change and a, and a behavioral change and, uh, all of, in a, in a purpose change. Uh, because God has certainly done that for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, my second passage I want you to ask you to turn to is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the reason I'm asking you to turn to this one is because I, oh, on Sunday I talked about uh, the fact that we are ambassadors and I didn't read this verse, I didn't quote this verse. And so I'm just going to give you some reminders here from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it's always 
I'll just say it's always neat to me that in Second Corinthians chapter 5, it starts out by talking about our hope. And then it kind of goes to our, the fact that, to our accountability, uh, that we have that, that we have that assured hope and that anticipation, but while we're down here anticipating it and waiting for it, uh, we need to take in, we need to take into consideration that how we're living now, uh, will be, uh, will be well pleasing in, in the day that our hope is realized. But, um, not wanting to sermonize tonight, uh, just pick out, let me pick out a few verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, let me read 14 and 15, all right? Uh, 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. I mean, that's only reasonable. Uh, if he died for all, that means all were dead. Uh, and because we were all dead, Christ died for all. So anyway, continuing into verse 15, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And I chose these verses because we were all dead. Uh, even Ephesians tells us we were dead in trespass and sins, Ephesians chapter 2, but now we are alive unto God. And so uh, Christ died for all, uh, so that those of us who, who have trusted in Christ and are, are, in alive, are alive in him, uh, I forgot my preposition there, uh, alive in him, can now live for him. All right, and so um, we have a new life to live, and and I point that out because it, it's another verse that shows us salvation isn't just well getting to go to heaven someday. I mean that's a pretty big perk. Don't get me wrong, but it is it is a a new way to live. Uh, Christ has set us free to truly live, uh, and that's part of what salvation is. Uh, and and he's he died so that we don't have to live for ourselves anymore, but we can live for the one who died for us, and uh, that also ties into what we're well the next our well our sermons in in Ephesians. We're going to talk about now living for the one who died uh, and gave himself for us. Jump down to the last two verses of chapter five, if you will. Uh, that would be chapter or uh, uh, Second Corinthians chapter five verse twenty says now uh, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. See, I wasn't making that up on Sunday. We are ambassadors for Christ, um, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And uh, I already I already dealt with this Sunday, but uh, the fact that in Christ place. And the reason we are here in Christ's stead is because he is seated at, seated at the right hand of the Father. And we have the wonderful opportunity to, in his place, represent him well. Uh, to, to, to make sure that his message uh, is getting out and to live in a way that honors him uh, as ambassadors in Jesus Christ. And so we are ambassadors. It doesn't say, and you can be ambassadors. It says we are. Uh, and uh, that's another part, that is another blessing of our salvation, uh, that not only can we live uh, that life now, uh, but we can now represent him uh, well. Uh, and again, we are going to start on Sunday by by uh, going through those different sections that that tell us this is the way we represent Christ well uh, within our, uh, within our own assemblies uh, within the body of Christ and also out in in the world. So uh, another passage I would like to ask you to turn is the book of Titus, chapter one. And uh, as I was reviewing this uh, these verses today, I thought, you know what, I should do a study in the book of Titus. Uh, sometime, so, well, that's, maybe we'll plan to do that. Who knows? All right. All right. Uh, Titus chapter one. And I'm going to begin in verse 11. All right. Titus chapter one says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So, uh, lest ye think that these things are less important, uh, lest you think the, the last three chapters of Ephesians are less important than the first three chapters, uh, here we have uh, Paul writing to Titus, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, to speak these things, uh, exhort and rebuke. Uh, you have all authority to do so with these things. And so uh, let us let us pick this apart very quickly, okay? First of all, salvation has appeared to all. That means that uh, that offer of salvation is not extended just to one nation, just to one group, just to one family, just to one, just to certain special people. It has gone out to all. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, we already read in 2 Corinthians 5, all were dead, and so he died for all. And because he died for all, so that we, you know, well, I'm not going to repeat those verses. But salvation has appeared. It, it is a, the, the dispensation of the grace of God is an announcement saying, Hear ye, hear ye, all nations, all members of all nations, this is what God is doing through Jesus Christ. And it's appeared to all. And uh, the ne very next verse there, verse 12 that I read, uh, is it, it tells us that um, the grace of God appears, and uh, and what is focused on here is that God has done what he's done in Jesus Christ so that our lives can change. And I'll go as far to say our behavior should change. Uh, and um, because it, it because one of the things the grace of God teaches us, it is to deny things, to deny things that, uh, well, worldly lust. Uh, and all of those things that the flesh uh, makes the fl that the flesh desires, uh, and so that grace of God teaches us that those things need to be avoided and denied and uh, and put to death. Uh, and instead, there are ways we should live. And so, when God extended His grace, and when you are graced through Jesus Christ. Uh, once again, God has graced you so that you can not live a certain way and instead live a different way. Uh, oh, by the way, I didn't read that verse. I was going to write it down. Uh, but, but there in second Corinthians, uh, Corinthians where it says we are a new creation. Uh, we, once again, part of the salvation package is, is that an amazing change happens to us. Uh, not physically. We still look the same, but, uh, but inwardly, and we are now new. And because we're new, life is new. Uh, but, but getting back here, focusing on Titus, because I left 2 Corinthians 5 behind. But deny this, live this way. Uh, but also the reminder that we're looking for that blessed hope. Uh, and that should, that someday, one day, that promise should affect today. Uh, that in that day, uh, we're, worldly lust and all those things, and that's not going to be us anymore. It's it's not even going to be. Um, uh, it's not even going to be. Um, uh, it's not going to be part of the equation. All right, and so because that's our future, because of our present, presently who we are in Jesus Christ, this is now what should be the priority and and the way we behave. Uh, and then uh, notice verse 14. Verse 14 puts it as blunt and as plain as plain gets. Uh, it says, who gave himself for us. Our Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us. He voluntarily took our place. Uh, and then it says, not so that we can be delivered from hell, although that's true. It doesn't say so that we can go to heaven. It doesn't say that. I mean, it said that in verse uh, 13, but that's not the focus here in, 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 I'm sorry, verse 13. That's not the focus here in verse 14. Uh, it doesn't say so that, here's what it says. Christ died for us. He gave himself for us so that we can be redeemed from all iniquity. So there's that part of it. We're redeemed from iniquity uh, and so that we can be a peculiar people. 
Uh, and I always make the joke, and people probably don't laugh anymore because they're like, we heard that 28 times, but you still keep saying it. Uh, some of us are more peculiar than others. Uh, but God's people today uh, are are the body of Christ. Uh, and that is how his peculiar people today. Uh, and uh, and then it says, zealous of good works. So Christ died for us. Christ redeemed us from all iniquity. Christ created a peculiar people so that we will zealously work for him. And then he goes on and says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. It is, I'm thinking I'm not I don't want to say this in a negative way so let me say this so let me say it this way um, how wonderful it is let me let me rewind a little bit unfortunately because there are various reasons why this is true um, some of it is because of ex- personal experience you know how how people how works were taught you know growing up or whatever or the denomination we were in or some of it has to do with just faulty theology some of it some of it has to do with um uh selfishness you know we don't want to be told to do or or whatever it is no matter what the reason we need to start seeing Opening the, the the Bible, and and more specifically, opening Paul's epistles, and going beyond Ephesians three into four, five, and six, uh, coming here to Titus, uh, and showing people God saved you to work, and to use words such as God has expectations for you, God has entrusted you with responsibilities. Uh, to re- to to speak that God has given us a duty to to perform. Uh, these are blessings because of who we are in Christ. Because we don't have to worry: Are we going to heaven or not? We are if we've trusted in Jesus Christ. Because we don't have to worry: Oh no, I need to add this bless- blessing to my Christian be- my Christian uh, vest. We have all blessings. Uh, we have all the awards. We are sons of God. We are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Well, all of these things. Um, we have been set free to live. And what a what a blessing that that is. And uh, while I love, you know, Ephesians chapter 1, well, I love, man, what a chapter. Well, I love Ephesians chapter 2. Again, what a, what a chapter. I love Ephesians chapter 3. What a chapter. Uh, I love Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 and 6. What a chapter. Uh, and I know I need to be reminded of these things. That, that um, we've been fitted and furnished to work for the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. What a service to be in. Uh, and so I, I, I'm thankful that I have these, what was it, what's it been, about a half an hour to just kind of tack on uh, to my Sunday message uh, to, uh, uh, to remind us of the vocation wherewith we have been called. Uh, we, can co- we can title it whatever we want to, uh, zealous workers, we can title it ambassadors, whatever it is, but ultimately it comes down to serving and working for the Lord Jesus Christ here in a way that pleases him, our Lord and Savior. Uh, So uh, thank you for joining me uh, this evening and taking this half hour or so. Uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer and then I'm going to, I have one more uh, kind of thing to tell you. All right, so let's pray. God and Father, thank you for this opportunity that I've been given. Uh, Just to open your scriptures and be reminded of all you have done for us. And to be reminded that we don't have to wait one day to to serve you and enjoy who we are. But right now today, you want us to experience and to know what it is to be zealous of good works for you. So may we be uh, well-pleasing ambassadors. May May we do a good job of fulfilling our responsibility in Christ's stead. Uh, and 
And we begin to see work, not as a bad four-letter word, but what a blessing it is. Thank you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.